the person who may have some of the answers is Bart Floss. Bart is a futurologist in the Netherlands, and he joins us now. Bart, thank you so much for your time. I wonder when you think about the future, do you think about it with a smile or a frown? Just run us through briefly about some of the most major changes you think might be coming. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, by the way. Um, I'm I look at it with a, a smile, but it's a, it's a worried smile. Uh, I'm a futurologist, so I look a little bit further ahead than the next one or two years. And allow me to be blunt here from the Netherlands, as we're used to here, nothing is going to change in the long run, in the long run, in terms of our behavior as a human species. It will change within the next one or two years until we have a medicine and then we have a vaccine. And then we go back to normal. There's a perfectly good explanation for that. I'm slightly worried as an incorrigible optimist that this time, when we go back to our old normal, which we will, um, we will be too late to take active measurement because we're currently um, uh, distracted uh, because of the coronavirus, because climate change and global warming are still coming. So I'm slightly worried. I'm still smiling, but I'm slightly worried. I'm very interested to hear that you say that in terms of the longer term, regarding your speciality of being a futurologist, that nothing will change. OK, I just wonder whether there are certain examples, and death is one measurement. Death of a stranger can produce a sadness, right? Death of a family member obviously becomes a tragedy. When we yes. see the numbers of deaths being reported around the world, and many countries have not reached anywhere near the peak of their pandemic. The scientists are telling us that this thing is going to be around for maybe two or three years. It's even possible that a vaccine will never be found. But then you get very specific examples that are happening right now. And I'm going to give you one from Robert Reich, who used to be a US Secretary of Labor. He served under three presidents. He's now a professor at Berkeley. And he says during 23 days, of the current restrictions in place across the United States. Here's the number. He says that America's billionaires increased their collective wealth by $282 billion. That's yes. about $12 billion a day. So when people yes. see figures like that, do they not think, actually, you know what? I want something to change. I'm going to start listening to those people who have that, what's now considered an alternative view and start supporting a political party that wants to tax billionaires. And that's just one example, Bart. What do you think? That's an excellent example. And it, it kind of underlines my statement here that nothing changed. Even during the pandemic, uh, let's say our lust for greed has no limits. Let me try to explain what I mean, why I think nothing will change. As a futurologist, I have to look further ahead. But not only that, I have to look at us, homo sapiens, the, new, the, 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 the human condition, what are we? We are still, uh, we are still uh, beings um, living in small groups. So that's why we share our sentiments. Small groups are everywhere. We have been able to connect small groups. Those are the same small groups as we were when we were hunter-gatherers. But those, the connection of these small groups makes us capable of doing large things. Why do I say nothing will change? Um, when we, uh, in the end, when we long for going back to the normal, billions, billionaires just want to make more billions. So what I'm trying to, to explain to people is simply put this. If you ask anyone in your own small groups, with the small groups, I mean our households, our families, our colleagues, our friends, our teammates, just ask the question, are you willing as an individual to, let's say, cut back your life 30%, your wealth, your material, the stuff that you have, everything that you do, your potential growth, maybe even the growth in as a family. Are you willing to reduce that by 30%? If the answer is no, we have a big problem. In the end, in the long run, we are, as creatures of habit, go back to what we do best. That means that we, geographically, we don't look further ahead than our house or street. Uh, our country, and in terms of time, not much further ahead than the summer holiday next year. We are basically still operating in small groups. The moment we start answering that question with, yes, I would like to, and you can find individuals that will answer yes, but the change has to come 
from bigger communities willing to cut down, let's say 30%, that's just a figure I just made up, cut down on what we do. In the end, it's not COVID-19, it's not even global warming, it's overpopulation that will get us. But we are a strange species. We want to go back to doing the stuff in our small groups that we are used to. That's a generic thing. It's programmed into us by evolution and natural selection. I think we should focus on what we are. There's also hope. But I fear, and that's a risk, with high probability and high impact, that the moment we have a vaccine, if a vaccine is established and we feel relatively safe, we'll go back. We'll go back to our offices. We're not made as human beings to Skype. We are made to communicate. We are still social group mammals and we want to feel and touch. And we're greedy. And uh, we have a tendency um, not to like other people. We are superstitious as well. We have to look at the nature of what we are before we can understand that I'm saying nothing will change. Within two years after the vaccine, within one or two years, will have gone back to making more billions, being more greedy. Uh, and that's the worry I've got. The only way to change that is from within these small groups. And yes, you're right, we have to change it within the political systems that we're part of. Okay, uh, okay, let's look at the environment. Um, there is a certain philosophy which pretty much backs up what you're saying, is that actually, it's almost too late now to make the changes that are required to keep the planet safe from the very worst effects of the climate crisis. So at what point do we reach that the effects are being seen and are so bad that actually people then decide, look, the system that is in place, the people who are in positions of power, those people who support the neoliberal economic system, the ones who hold the reins of power, that they see that actually their market is being diminished by the very worst effects of the climate crisis, that actually they have to make the change just to make the neoliberal system survive even further. You're saying that that's not gonna happen because of COVID-19. Do you actually think looking even beyond the coronavirus pandemic, that that change could ever happen if the very system that the world is built upon becomes threatened? Well, that's interesting. And uh, there's a funny thing. I, I saw a, a, a cultural meme floating by on uh, on the social media. It's, it's very interesting. You see this little human being swimming just below the surface. With one stroke, he can break that surface. There's a big white shark beneath him with its jaws wide open. And there's a little arrow that says COVID-19. But below that white shark is an even bigger white shark with an arrow pointing to it saying um, global warming. I would like to add an even bigger white shark be beneath that one. And that has a little arrow pointing to it that says overpopulation. All the things that we are used to, all the political systems that we are engaged in, the interesting thing, we had a common enemy. I call that the common enemy principle. Um, global warming affects us all. It's uh, boundless. There's no uh, boundaries for that. It just. But we have 40 years ago, we knew exactly what was coming, and we haven't done what is required. And now, um, well, almost <laughs> as a coincidence, we are confronted with something that's also a common enemy, which is. Uh, boundaryless, and that's a virus, it's acute. It has changed all of our lives in a matter of two or three months. Now we're worried about what we have. Still, the rich are enriching themselves. That's human nature right there. So what I'm trying to say here is, even with this common enemy, this is like the last resort. If we now do not understand that we have to fundamentally change the way we live as a species, we will go the way 99.99 .99 of all species ever roaming the earth have been extinct because of major disasters such as meteors and stuff like that, but also because we grew with too much numbers. Any exponential curve, if not mitigated, will be struck down, not by lightning, but by a disaster. So overpopulation will in the end cure all of our problems because the earth, the universe, 
is fundamentally indifferent about us. We have to change it. Why am I saying that nothing will change? Because we have to fundamentally change what we are in nature. We have to change what we are programmed with by evolution and natural selection. And that is to exist in small groups, to be afraid of people outside our groups and to make sure that we will survive, that we can pass on our genes to the next generation. That small group behavior, that behavior of hunter-gatherers will not get us through. And we know all this, we know what we have to do. We've written a million books about it. What I'm worried, and hopefully somebody will remember it in two years when we're all back to our normal lives, then global warming will hit us and it will hit our children and our children's children far worse than what's going on now. I would hope that the coronavirus is actually something that will um, stimulate all of us. It will influence all of us, even the, the people in, in high office, even the billionaires, that in the long run, nothing will remain. So I'm a bit skeptical for the first time as an uncourageable optimist, I'm a bit pessimistic about us going back to what we used to, because we are now in this mess because of what we're doing to the environment. And forget about all the conspiracy theories. Genetically, the, uh, scientists have looked at the virus genetic. There, there's nothing genetically engineered about this virus. It's just a bat that pooped on a market somewhere in China. It's happened before. It's okay. a warning for us all. Okay. But I'm sorry, we have run out of time, but you know what? You started no this interview by saying you were typically Dutch and blunt, and you certainly are, but really, really interesting to hear your thoughts. Really appreciate you joining us on the program. Futurologist Bart Floss in the Netherlands. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.